Hello, hello. Here we are. Lily. Hi, guys. Thank you all for coming here. It's really nice. I'll start this off before we pass it over to the audience. What's that? But I'll start this off before we pass it over to the audience. But yes. uh, how did you first find your way into puppetry? I know it was very early on. It was. Um, let's see. I think the first puppet show I ever did was actually in about the second grade. And the teacher brought us in and said, uh, I was seven, and she said, we're going to make, you know, the paper sack puppets, like the brown paperback? <laughs> I, well, you can make a mouth out of the bottom fold. And I did some character. I, was, I think it was like a lion. It was probably really terrible. And when we did our little puppet show, I said something that my classmates laughed at. And I thought, oh, that kind of feels kind of good. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, uh, but then my, my real passion for puppetry happened when Sesame Street came on the air in uh, about 1968 or 69. I was 10, and I just fell in love with those characters and with the Muppets at that point and just wanted to know how it worked. You know, I was too old for the curriculum, kind of, but I just watched the show every day. I read that you actually first started working at the uh, World of Sid and Marty Croft. At I did. Park. Yeah, it was a, a short-lived theme park in Atlanta uh, in a building that's now uh, the CNN Center. It's where CNN broadcasts from, but it was an eight-level indoor theme park. The only time anybody that I know of has ever tried an indoor theme park, and it didn't last very long, but I worked there from the day it opened till the day it closed. It was I call it my first professional puppet job, <laughs> but it was great fun. So I guess the, the big question is, how does one find their way into the, the Henson Company? How did you get an audition process? Well, at, that, at the point in time when I came in, um, th it was the third season of the original Muppet show back in the late 70s. And I was just barely out of high school. I was 18. And I met, how many of you know who Carol Spinney is or was? Carol just passed away. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite people in the world. And Carol was in Atlanta for a... Um, a puppetry festival, a super small kind of convention. And I didn't even know these conventions existed, but I went to this thing because I wanted to meet someone who worked with the Muppets. I, I wasn't even thinking about a job. And um, I guess I was the only person there who was, who had puppets that were Muppet-like puppets, Muppet-style puppets, you know, the moving mouth and the eyes that were like the Muppet's eyes and the rods with the hands and all. And, um, you know, I met Carol, and it was a thrill for me, and I never thought I'd hear from him again. And about four months later, he contacted me and said that Jim Henson was looking for new puppeteers, and he thought I should get in touch with him. And so that was how it happened. I was kind of recruited into the group. Uh, and Jim hired a couple of new people at that point. Uh, work was starting to really build up for Jim. It was the Muppet Show, and that was super popular. He was about to do the films and going into things like Dark Crystal and those things. <clears throat> Who was your favorite guest that you got to work with on the original Muppet Show? F favorite guest? Yes. <clears throat> That's a really hard question because yeah. it was a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, I came in the middle of the Muppet Show, so I guess over the course of that time, I probably worked with, you know, 200 celebrities oh, wow. over the course of that time. But I had some favorites. The, my very first show was with Alice Cooper. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was great. Excellent. I was I was 18 or 19, and you know, it was the height of his popularity at the end of the 70s, and of course, I was a huge fan and. I was a former, you know, long-haired rock and roll guy in high school, and so I got to work with Alice Cooper my first week on The Muppet Show, you know, oh. and he was incredibly friendly to me. And the great thing about Jim Henson was that I was this new young guy who was completely new to the whole process, had never been in anything as big as that, but Jim immediately began to treat me as though I was just one of the people who was there all the time. It wasn't like I was the new guy who didn't get to meet Alice Cooper. I mean, you know, I was immediately welcomed into the group, so I spent actually quite a lot of time. I think I was maybe the only guy there who actually knew Alice's music, because um, I was such a super fan, you know. Yeah. At the, the close to that story, if I can tell you real quickly, some of you may know, at uh, the Louisville Galaxy Con last year, Alice was there, and I, we had run into each other a couple times over the years, but it had been 20 years. And Alice and I redid a photo that he did with me when I was there on The Muppet Show with him. So it, and it was almost 40 years to the day uh, that we did the original photo. It was, we did that photo again of us now. <laughs> so we both survived 40 years, you know, <laughs> it was great. Well, there were two other music icons you've worked with over the course of your uh, work with the Muppets. One is uh, David Bowie on Labyrinth, yeah. and the other on Muppets Tonight, you got to work with Prince. Yes, okay. oh yeah, yeah, Prince was amazing. We, uh, let me tell you about Prince first, oh, because sure. we, I was also a huge fan of Prince. This was the Purple Rain days, you know, so Prince was a really big deal. And he was coming in to work with us, and we were all thrilled. And 
but we were kind of told, you know, you kind of need to, don't, you know, don't, don't look him in the eyes. It was one of those strange, <laughs> leave him alone. He likes to be, you know, don't bother him. And so, you know, we took it very seriously. And we're on set, and we're working with Prince all day. And then he would go sit in his director's chair, kind of in the middle of the room, and people walked all the way around him. And I thought, well, this is just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> So Dave Goles, who is the puppeteer who does Gonzo and many other Muppet characters, and I just sort of thought, this is stupid. So we went over and started talking to him, and it, it was ridiculous. It was like some a publicist or something who thought he, we shouldn't bug him, but he really wanted to connect with people. So he was a totally <laughs> different kind of person than what he was portrayed to be. And uh, I just loved meeting him. You know, very quiet, but he seemed to love the Muppets and really respond to them. Awesome. And then Bowie was a, you know, what an icon. And I was a... Ma again, a massive fan of his music before I met him. Yeah. Uh, and, um, I mean, just to hang out with him was amazing, you know. He, very personable, very approachable. He did not particularly care to talk about himself. He didn't need for you to say, oh, you, I, you know, I'm such a big fan. I, I love your work. And, of course, I was complete fanboy on with him. <laughs> um, to the point where it got silly. I mean, I was <laughs> over the top. But he really, he, he just, he didn't, he didn't, it wasn't that he didn't appreciate his fans, it's that he didn't need to hear from them, because he was doing his work because he loved his work, yeah. uh, and he would have done it if he didn't sell it. I mean, he's just enjoying his time, you know, so, so it was really better just to connect with him on a different level, yeah. well, outside of the work in a way, you know. That's awesome. <laughs> Fine, we've got plenty of people who have questions. Yeah. So, what's your favorite Muppet besides Kermit? Well... <laughs> So favorite that I performed? Is that what you mean? Uh, yeah. Of my characters? Besides I, Kermit. Yeah, besides Kermit. Mm -hmm. I, I, I always, as a kid, as a little person, how old are you? Nine. Well, when I was about 10 is when I really got into Sesame Street, and I was very drawn to Kermit as a character. I loved that character. But from a performer standpoint, my favorite one to ever perform was Rizzo the Rat. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very, uh, very different kind of character than Kermit. So, you know, Kermit could be very pure, and, and uh, he was your best friend who lived next door. Uh, and then, you know, okay, so I've had enough of that for the day. Now I get to do Rizzo, you know. <laughs> but the funny part of doing Kermit was when, when I sort of inherited Kermit, it became the thing I did all the time. Yeah. And so I didn't get to do Rizzo and the other characters very much anymore because Kermit was in everything all the time, which is great. I mean, that was wonderful. But uh, whenever I got the chance to do Rizzo at that point, I was really sinking my teeth into having fun with it, you know. It's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> Swift, I know obviously the reason why you ended up taking up the role of Kermit and Ernie was because of the passing of Jim. Yeah. Um, what was the process of getting that role? Was there an audition process? Or they just no, there wasn't. It was, um, it was unexpected. You know, Jim died suddenly. He, right. he caught a virus that was, that was a deadly yeah. virus, and he was a, otherwise a very healthy person. Yeah. So it was unexpected, and Jim never really, we never did understudies, or people were, it didn't make sense to do that in the Muppet world, because, you know, if you say, well, okay, we're now getting you to be the understudy for Kermit, what do you do in the meantime? If What does that person do until, you know, I die? Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe they kill me off and take Kermit, yeah. I don't know. But, but they, <laughs> but you know, it didn't, it didn't really make sense, so we just rolled with that, that situation, and, um, I guess what had happened was evidently Jim, who was trying to sell his company to Disney in those years in the early at the early nineties, um, had said, you know, if I if if this sale goes through and we sell to Disney, I might be so busy as a creative person that I might not be able to continue to be Kermit. Um, so I guess he had mentioned to a couple of people he he was thinking he might say, you know, maybe Steve does this, yeah. uh, which is a great compliment for me, a great honor. Um, so that's how it happened. He had just mentioned it in passing. He never mentioned it to me. Yeah. Uh, it was a surprise to me. Yeah. Um, so, no, it wasn't really about audition. It was about, I, I always called it like a linear passage, of, you know, lineage, yeah. like any lineage where, where a person who does something designates the next person who will follow, yeah. which I think is kind of right with the Muppets. You yeah, know? Absolutely. Yeah. Next one. What is your favorite Muppet movie out of all of them? Well, you know, the very first one is a real favorite, the, the original with Rainbow Connection and all that, because um, it was, I was 18 or something when I worked on it, and I just joined the Muppets a couple months before, and it was, everything was new and wonderful. And it was also Jim's first feature film with the Muppets. Mm -hmm. So that one is real special, and probably 
right alongside that is Muppet Christmas Carol because that was the, f yeah, it's a great film. And it was the first um, film where I really played Kermit on anything major, so that was wonderful. It's a great film, you know, so I like that one a lot too. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Was your mind as blown as the rest of ours when you saw Kermit riding a bike for the first time? Well, I was, yeah, and I was, and I was, uh, it was fun because I was willing to do anything they asked me to do, and one of the things I got to do was was have Kermit riding the bicycle. We did. It's super simple. I mean, people ask, but it was just. Um, uh, you know, a small bicycle with Kermit attached on top, like a like a stuffed version of Kermit. And then we were in what they call the cherry picker, you know, these big giant cranes that would help put you up about 30 feet in the air with two long pieces of fishing line. So it was, you know, and the, the problem was that if you didn't keep the exact, because uh, we're moving on actual dirt ground, so it was up and down and up and down. And if you didn't keep the right tension on those two pieces of, of monofilament, it would fall over because it wasn't balanced. It was a real bicycle, yeah. you know? And so that was the challenge of Kermit. And I think the shot you see of him riding along the road is probably out of maybe 40 takes was the only one that worked, you know? It was really hard. <laughs> uh, simple, but hard, yeah. you know? <laughs> Next question. Hello again. Yes, uh, sir. I got a question. Sure. Were you, Beaker, doing the Feelings Mimi song that I shot? Um, I've been sending this all around the world, by the way. It's hilarious. Yeah. Was, uh, that, were that, was that you or someone else? The, the feelings. The feelings. He hung his heart out. I did feelings. Cause ri now, Richard Hunt was the puppeteer who actually orig originated Beaker. Okay. Uh, Richard passed away in 1992, a couple years after Jim. So we lost two of our wow. the major guys at that point. And as it was with Kermit or Ernie, I kind of inherited Beaker. Okay. Uh, so I did not do that one. I did everything since then. But yeah, that's, <laughs> that's an amazing piece, though. That's hilarious. Thanks. I think that may be the first time Beaker sung a song, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and it, what a great song for Beaker to sing. I sing it on YouTube all the time. It's yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we did some others since then with Beaker that were great fun, like, um, oh, I don't know, we did Ode to Joy, and wow. where he's singing nine parts, and <laughs> you know, it, it, crazy stuff, you know. I love Beaker. Did you have to figure out exactly how to moderate your uh, Mimi Mimi Apes too? Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and, you know, we actually sung in that voice. And the thing about Beaker is, you know, it is that high-pitched sound, if you know Beaker. But the way Richard always did that was not, I, I couldn't do it right now if you asked me to, I'm so hoarse. But it was, it's not, you're not pushing air out, you're pulling air in through your vocal cords. So it's like, oh, oh, well, I almost did it. But, but, but you're, so try singing that way. I mean, try hitting pitches that way. But, but it, was, it was pulling air in, so you have to exhale before you do bigger and then pull all the air in, <laughs> you know. <laughs> with the resurgence of practical effects in film yeah. and television and with the popularity of projects like Dark Crystal Age of Resistance, yeah. are you seeing a change in the industry and how puppets and Muppets are approached and how they're produced and managed? Yeah. Well, you know, really honestly, in the industry as a whole, I guess I'm slightly out of the loop because I'm focusing so much on my own stuff right now. Um, I know what I'm doing, <laughs> and, and I was always in favor of, and, I th and I, I, my sense is that Jim would have felt the same way uh, because he was always embracing all the new technologies. I think he would have wanted to use you know, CG and, and computer enhancements of what we were already doing. I don't think he would have replaced the Muppets with that. Um, but, you know, there's some things that are awfully hard to do with a hand puppet. And while we were always very pure about the puppetry, we wanted it to be puppetry, we also, he was doing, you know, green screen stuff back before anybody actually knew how to make it work well, you know. Um, so is the industry changing? I don't really know. I think, I think there's, there's a focus on people realizing <clears throat> that regardless of whether you can do as much with puppets like Yoda or whoever it might be, as you could do with, with a computer-generated character, there's a place for it. And I think we all, I think as fans, we see the, we can see the difference. Mm -hmm. And there's something about knowing that that, you know, thing is there next to the actor and it's not done after the fact and it's all real performance time. I think it adds something to it that you can't always get out of a CG character, you know. Um, but I think they both have their place. I, but I quite love the idea of doing characters, and like if you want a character to walk across the stage, that can be hard to do. You can do it with puppetry and green screens and all that stuff. 
could also, you know, animate the legs, and I think that's acceptable. <laughs> yeah. The Muppets were always, we kind of worked from the waist up, you know? <laughs> you know. Part of the illusion for us was to make you hopefully accept that there was a ground down there that they were standing on, that we played them so that you felt that they were against something, even though they didn't exist from the waist down most of the time, <laughs> you know, so that, you know. <laughs> I don't know whether I actually answered your question or not. Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> I hem hot around. I, you, know. <clears throat> you talk about working on your own stuff. Do you want to take a moment to plug your current uh, interactive oh, sure. show? Sure. Oh, I'd love to if I can. Uh, some of you know about this if you've been by the table. But I, about six or eight months ago, uh, I started doing um, a monthly live stream with a new character called Weldon the IT Guy. And Weldon, <laughs> who I don't have with me today, is a is the IT for Weldon stands for Internet Troll. So he's this little curmudgeonly little creature who lives in a cave all alone, and he hacks people's websites, and he's a troll, he's an internet troll, uh, only he's an actual real troll. And the point of the show is, for me to be able to, really, is for me to be able to do what I always love to do with Kermit or the other characters, which is to interact with people as we improvise and just play. And sometimes it's funny and sometimes it isn't. But, but it's enjoyable, so every month we do a, a call-in live stream show on YouTube, where you as a viewer can call in and talk to Weldon. And what Weldon wants to hear is your most miserable experiences, because he's a troll. He <laughs> thrives on your misery. Uh, and he takes your side on it, you know, and it, oh yeah, you know, those people are terrible, or whatever. But we've been having fun, and the other thing I've been able to do is some sort of Muppet-like production numbers where Weldon plays all the roles. Um, I only have the one character, so Weldon is like a cosplayer. Um, <laughs> and he dresses in all the costumes, and we shot some pieces with part of the cast of Gotham, uh, and with the Stranger <laughs> Things kids, some of those guys. Lou Ferrigno did a piece with us. Next month, we're doing a piece with Brian O'Halloran, who's here at the show. Uh, it, Weldon basically interviews Brian as a candidate to be a troll, you know. <laughs> so, so, so the next one is Friday, uh, Friday the 27th of March at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard. So you can find us on YouTube. If you search Weldon the IT Guy on YouTube, it'll pop up. And you can see the past stuff we've done, plus the, you can tune in for the live show there as well. So I'd love it if you guys did that. It's, I, I, you know, I'd love to get a, a following. And I need people, it's funny because if you're like me, you don't always have time to be where, where you know, your favorite television show, you might watch it later. But what I need is for people to call live. So any of you who want to actually be there on that Friday night and call, oh, I wouldn't get to everybody, but you know, over the course of time, it's nice to have actual callers. Because that's what the whole show is. So keep that in mind. That'd be very cool. <laughs> Next. Steve, first of all, thank you for joining us here in Richmond. Oh, thank you for that. I and appreciate it. My, my only question is that I was hoping you'd share one of your favorite Jim Henson memories with us. Oh, wow. God, so many. Um, the first time I ever met Jim, uh, he, had, he had gotten in touch with me through Carol Spinney. I think I mentioned that. Um, and said, you know, I want to bring you to New York and we'll meet. And he, he had almost guaranteed me a job with the Muppets in some capacity before we ever met, which is kind of interesting, based just on Carol saying, you know, this guy really loves the Muppets, and I mean, <laughs> that's all he had to go on. Um, and I think I sent a videotape of some, some stuff I had done, which was pretty bad. Um, <laughs> but he basically said, I can tell you, I want to bring you to New York, and I, and I, I can pretty well guarantee you I'm going to give you some job with the Muppets. Uh, he thought I might be working in the shop building puppets. I never really did that. Um, but when I got to New York, I, one of my favorite memories is the first time I ever saw Jim face to face, I had gone to the office where they, they had this little obscure sign above the door that said Henson Associates. And um, Jim, it was er way too early in the morning. They didn't get things going around there till about 10. And I think I was so excited I showed up about 8.30. And so I'm like trying to get in the door. And the door flew open and it was Jim. And he had spent the night there. His hair was all messed up. He had worked late, stayed overnight and was sweeping the stairs. This is like at the height of the popularity of The Muppet Show, and the guy who owns the whole company is sweeping the stairs. <laughs> but that's Jim, you know? He was hands-on on every part of what his work and his company and everything was. He's a very humble, simple person who just happened to be this kind of creative genius, you know? <laughs> that's awesome, thank you. Yeah, oh, sure, sure. <laughs> Actually, have two questions. Okay. One is like you told me earlier today that you ha you got like a lot of fan mail and you like kept it all. Where did you put it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got some of it, and and my uh, recent more recently it's kind of started to overflow. So I'm just keeping it and just filing it away. I've got it in boxes and piles. Um, and my my 
Comic-Con, the person who books me in Comic-Con is my agent, Tim, is keeping some of it. But I just kind of wanted to hang on to it. People will sometimes bring drawings and photos and little things, and I try to hang on to all that stuff, you know. You know. No. Yeah, it, it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot to store. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, my other one is, like, I know you play a lot of big characters, but what is your favorite, like, smaller method that you play? You mean, like, lesser known kind of thing? Yeah. Um, I did this weird character back, back on um, Muppets Tonight called Mr. Poodle Pants. Um, <laughs> somebody must know who he is because you clap. Um, he was this strange, he, I, he was a weird character. And he came from a guy named Kirk Thatcher, who's one of our writers and directors and puppet designers who's been around forever. Kirk's a terrific guy. And Kirk is also a zany character person. He's not a puppeteer exactly, but he's also done some acting. And he did this, uh, do any of you know who Ed Wynn was? He's this actor, no. yeah. He would do this Ed Wynn character voice. And because he wasn't really a puppeteer, they, let, they wanted me to do the character. And I kind of figured out some version of the voice. What we really should have done is have, is trained Kirk to be a puppeteer and he should have done it. But I had, <laughs> I had a lot of fun with that character nonetheless. And you know, you probably never heard of him. <laughs> Just strange fellow, Mr. Poodle Pants. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hey, um, what is what is your favorite Muppet song? Muppet song? Yes. Oh, probably Mana Mana. <laughs> uh, yeah, I never I never performed that. I, you know, it wasn't a song that I performed as a character at all. But from my fan years, you know, it was always great to watch Mana Mana because of what Jim and Frank did with it as they were performing it. They took this song, which <clears throat> had nothing to do with the Muppets, and turned it into this classic thing. There was another one they used to do on Variety Show, to um, there was a trumpet uh, player named Al Hurd who did a song called Java, mm -hmm. and they had these two little loop characters that a uh, little tiny one and a big one at the end, the little one blows up the, the other one, you know? The, all those classic Muppet sketches from those early days I think are amazing. Uh, I have another question. Yeah, sure. What was your favorite Muppet movie to film? Oh, that's a hard question because they were all so much fun. Um, I actually have to say I quite enjoyed the last one I worked on was Muppets Most Wanted. <coughs> Excuse me, because I got to work with Tina Fey so much, um, who's amazing. Kermit was locked in prison for most of the film, <laughs> and uh, she was the the in the Rus Russian gulag, and she was like the, you know, the commandant of the gulag, and she's just an, an incredible person to work with. She's so great, and we had such fun. Uh, and those scenes in particular were really a really a great memory. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. How long did it take Jason Siegel to stop gushing when you first started working with you guys? Jason Siegel gushed, and so did uh, Ricky Gervais, who was a part of the other one. Ricky, <laughs> Ricky's a terrific guy, and um, he just, he would walk on set and just start laughing so hard we couldn't shoot. It was just like, it was just like laughter of excitement. It wasn't that anything was funny, it was just that he was so excited to be doing it. Just a great person. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Oh, hi. I do um, the Spark Richmond Theater co Company. Yeah. yeah. And I got to work with, with Paul Williams oh, the yeah. year, last year and the year before. What was it like working with him, and what was your schedule like doing the movie, that the first Muppet movie together with him, and how did you all <laughs> come up with singing the songs and writing them and doing all that stuff? Yeah, well, Paul, of, as you know, wrote the music for the first film, and he did a lot of other music with us over the year. Emma Daughter's Jug Band Christmas, he did all the music for that. Wow. Yeah, he That's did... Cool. Um, he did the music from Up at Christmas Carol. So we've had quite a lot of work with Paul Williams and some of the guys even more than me. Um, I mean, Paul's a, a wonderful person and he has such insight. He's like a Muppet himself, you know, he fits right in. <laughs> I used to joke with Kermit that they exchanged clothes, you know. Yeah. Is a, yeah. But Paul's great and, and I don't keep in touch as much as I should. Once in a while we've had a little contact. Um, in fact, I think it'd be very cool if he came to Comic Cons. I don't know whether he would do it. I'm going to pursue yeah. that. I'm yeah. going to look at it up. Paul and, and I could do Comic Cons together and do Rainbow Connection or something. Right. You know? Yeah. That'd be fun. And the Would other half of that question is did, did he hand you the songs and you sing them, or did he have any like certain way you had to do, had to act or be around him when he was doing the songs? Whenever I, well, he would write the songs in advance, and he had such a good sense of the characters that they were always right for the characters. Um, and then we would, we usually will pre record music prior to shooting. We'll, we'll go into a studio and record all the music. Um, mostly, and sometimes we'll go ahead back and sing it live, but mostly we don't. Mostly we're lip syncing to the songs. Um, 
And the process with Paul generally was that Paul was always in the recording studio, pardon me, with us. And, um, you know, we're, we're, in the, we're in front of the mic and he's in the booth and he's giving us notes and he's helping us learn it. Um, and he's there to help you right along the way. I mean, you know, to coach you through the singing. None of us are outstanding singers, you know, and, and we, but we, we get behind these crazy character voices and, you know, it's more as much about character as anything else. But oh. Paul's great. I mean, if you worked with him, you know that. Yeah. He's a wonderful guy. Because I think when we saw him, he was just losing, starting to lose his hearing. Oh, no. I didn't know that. So he actually is having, wow. he's not, almost like Beethoven. He has to see it now. Cause he, oh, really? Because he can only hear faintly. <clears throat> oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Huh. I guess these days he could probably put like a, a hearing aid in that would let him hear the music. Yeah, probably. Yeah. He's a good guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we should get Paul at Comic Con because I think that he, <laughs> well, he did a film. Very much. If you remember a thing called yeah. Phantom of the Paradise. Oh yes. yes. Yeah. Absolutely. See, he should come to yeah, Comic Con because it's perfect. I was going to ask you: the first time you had to do the uh, Kermit songs, yeah. Jim used to sing. Yeah. Was that difficult for you to be able to do <laughs> yes. that? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was very difficult. I was staring with so someone at the table today, maybe in the room, that I was um, the first time I remember singing Rainbow Connection live was in a room with, you know, about double this many people in an auditorium someplace. I don't remember what the event was. And, you know, Rainbow Connection starts with the banjo before Kermit sings. It's like the intro. Yeah. But as soon as people hear that, they know what you're about to sing. So <laughs> Kermit's on stage. The lights are coming up. I'm, you know, back there with the puppet. I'm ready to go. I'm all set. You know, voice is in good shape. And the minute the music hit, the audience roared with applause and <laughs> cheering. And I start, broke up. It, t it tore me up. So I thought, okay, I have like two bars to get back to the point where I can sing. Oh my God. And I thought, you know what? I really, I have to figure out how to do this without ever getting emotional. I can't be the guy singing and be emotional as Kermit. So, you know, you, you get past that. But, but yeah, it was very hard, very hard. I think Rainbow Connection more than something like Green. Yeah. You know, Green is, you, I can kind of concentrate on that song and, and get past it. But, you know, I mean, if, I, if Kermit were here right now, you sing Rainbow Connection, you guys would cheer and I would cry. You know, that's what happens. <laughs> you know, and people cry when they hear it. It's that kind of song, you know. It's a very emotional song, you know. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey. Yeah, hey. Um, so you were saying that how much you love working with, like, Prince and David yeah. Bowie. Oh, yeah. Um, who was your favorite guest from Sesame Street? Oh, wow. You know, it's funny on Sesame Street. Most of my time there, I did a little bit of Kermit there, but that was during where corporations were splitting up. So Kermit was kind of owned by one group and, you know, not by the other group. And mostly it was Ernie. <clears throat> and um, so, and most of what I did with Ernie was we would shoot the Ernie and Bert inserts. We'd do all those in a week. And then they would be dropped into each episode. So I was only on Sesame Street for a week or so. But occasionally Ernie would be on the street and they would call those show days. You're actually shooting an episode of the series. So when Ernie was on the street, <clears throat> one of my favorite things was um, when Christopher Reeve was there. Uh -huh. Because by this point, he was in the wheelchair and the whole thing. You know, he'd had the accident. But I had worked with him on The Muppet Show before that, it, when he was Superman, you know. And he remembered that. And without knowing that I was the guy who was now doing Ernie, he had requested that he get to work with Ernie because Ernie was his favorite character. Yeah. So suddenly I'm working with Chris Reeve again, you know. So we got to have that time before he passed away, and that was really neat. Um, and he was, you know, he had, he had, it was difficult for him to breathe on some level, but at the same time, he was, he was bound and determined to show that he was absolutely fine. So he and Ernie were doing the alphabet, and I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll probably have to go really slow. Not so. <laughs> he was like going through it, going through it, you know. Um, and he was just a great person, you know. So I'd, I'd probably say that. You know, we worked with a lot of great people there, but Chris Reeve was a, was a special one. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. What is your favorite puppet character from Jim Henson's Creature Shop? Wow, from the Creature Shop. Um, puppet character? Well, the only characters I really performed that were would be considered Creature Shop characters were the Skeksis. Um, and while I think they're amazing, it's hard to call them favorites because they were incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Okay, so from a character standpoint, they were great. From a from a being inside of them standpoint, it was really hard. Um, but just as a as a viewer, I always loved some of the stuff that ended up. Did any of you guys see the Storyteller series? 
some of that stuff was amazing. And I didn't work on any of that. Um, we were shooting another part of the Jim Henson Hour during that time with the Muppets. But there's one that they did. I don't know the name of it. You guys, somebody may know, where it was all these demons sitting around a table playing cards. And that those puppets, I just thought, were incredible. I'd love to have performed one of those. The, the story, you know, the storyteller gave me inspiration is one of the inspirations of a of an animated series that I wanted to do someday called yep. the Animated Twilight Zone. Oh, that sounds like fun. Yeah. You should do that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. Thank yeah. you. I, I had less um, over the years. I had less work with the creature shop characters, but I always loved doing it because it was a challenge. The difference between what it takes to make the Muppets slightly more abstract characters seem alive, and then the you know the living, breathing sort of creatures is a different, is a little bit more subtle performance. But after doing something like Dark Crystal, I know that carried over for me into performing all the other characters we did. I mean, the, the Fraggles were zany, you know. But back with Kermit, Kermit got more and more um, sort of living, breathing to me. I mean, I his the manipulation of the puppet got more subtle. And, and I, I wanted to do that because I wanted him to be this living entity in the world. You know, he had, a, he had a life off the screen that many of the fans would know about, you know. You sort of thought he went home after work, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a favorite Muppet show or Sesame Street skit? <clears throat> oh, let me think. Um, again, that's hard because there were so many hundreds of them. On the Muppet show, we did so much work. Wow, how could I choose a favorite? Uh, I, I'm drawing a complete blank. I, it's like it's like right now my brain is doing a Google search, <laughs> favorite Muppet Show skit, and and I'm and I'm not connecting to the internet. Um, I don't I don't have an answer for you. I, I mean, I, frankly, to tell you the honest truth, I loved every moment I was ever on the Muppet Show. I was I was 18 years old when I joined. Um, it was a dream come true, and I'm working at the feet of these master puppeteers and learning and absorbing and being right there involved in the whole process. Every guest star, even the guest stars that I didn't know who they were, I loved. You know, some of them were, uh, you know, older than my generation at that point. But but the opportunity to work with those people, you know, Bob Hope and Danny Kaye and Gene Kelly and, you know, Roy Rogers. <laughs> I mean, it was just <laughs> incredible. You know. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> opportunity to go back and make more Muppet movies. Yeah. Would you? Yes. Yes. I loved working with the Muppets so much. Oh, yeah. It was, uh, it was the best thing ever. And at the point in time when I was out of there, I really felt like whether you liked that ABC series or not, and a lot of people didn't, and I get it, and there were things about it I didn't like either, but I think the puppet work in that show was really good. Uh, I think our, our puppetry was great. Uh, you know, it's the other side of what we do is trying to make these characters that are the equivalent of a shirt, you know, basically, when they're laying in a chair, it, it, like these real living, breathing things. And I think we really, I felt like with Kermit, I learned a lot during the process of shooting those 16 episodes. Um, and, and that, finding that, for me, f as, a, as a puppeteer and, a, and an actor, finding that fine line between how zany and, and abstract they can be and yet keeping them something that you believe is alive at all times is, is really fun. It's the challenge of what we always did as the Muppets, you know, um, trying, to, trying to hopefully, you know, we all suspend our disbelief and we accept them as something that are alive, yeah. you know, yeah. Well, what was your favorite Henson project that didn't have Muppet in the title? Muppet in the title? Um, well, let's see. We, we did a couple of interesting things. I mean, I love dinosaurs. Yeah. Oh, which That's was great fun. Best yeah, series finale ever. Yeah, it was great, ever. right? <laughs> and that was a Henson Disney co-production back in the back right after Jim passed away. Uh, really, really a challenge. I mean, talk about a hard show to get done. It was about a seven-day show that we did in five days. So the hours were insane, and we were oh, and the, the characters were all you know these mechanical things that would break down every five minutes, and you know, and the poor guys in the creature shop were trying to mend them back together with duct tape and wire and. Keep them going, you know. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a pretty amazing show if you think about it for, you know, the state of the art at the time. Uh, the writing is very, you know, sophisticated and adult and all that, you know. That was a good one. A serious finale. Yeah, yes, yeah, where they, <laughs> they wipe out the entire species. Yeah, yeah you know. 
Good yeah. fun. Yeah. Okay, next. Earlier you talked about how the scene of Kermit on the bicycle was yeah, yeah, a very yeah. simple setup. Sure. So I was curious, does anything stand out in your memory as the most complicated <laughs> puppeteering setup that you were involved in? Well, let me think in? about that for a second. Jim used to have, Jim's saying used to be, he used to say simple is good. And then he would go on to do the most complicated thing you could ever <laughs> dream up. And I, all I can figure is what he really meant is it's good if it looks like it was simple. <laughs> Because he, he was, as I say, he was always trying to put all these different technologies into what we did. Um, complicated. Well, there, obviously, something like Dark Crystal was extremely complex uh, because all those were practical effects. Uh, every set was an actual set. There was no CG or anything. Well, um, I'm thinking in particular of a particular... Uh, like Muppet things? Or, or, uh, yeah. Wow, let me think. Yes. Well, so the a reason I leaned puppeteering job rather than an yeah, entire film. Yeah. The reason or show. I leaned to well, you know, actually something as simple as having the Electric Mayhem band play a number <laughs> can get very complicated because it, it can involve one, two to three puppeteers per character sometime, you know, depending on how much if you're seeing like legs or something, that's crazy. <laughs> we don't do legs and um, very well. And but playing the instruments, you know, and and we were always really sticklers about we want this character to look like they're actually playing that guitar or that keyboard. We want you to believe that they're hitting those notes. So we would spend endless hours learning those musical tracks exactly, you know, every note so that you would believe the manipulation, you know. Even that's very complicated. But back to Dark Crystal for a second. In those scenes where you see all the Skeksis in the same, like the same chamber around the crystal, that, I mean, you've got... I've forgotten how many sketches there was. Anybody know? It's, a t it's like a dozen of those. Nine. Thank you. And each of those, each of those sketches could have had as many as seven or eight people per sketches. So you're talking up in the 60s for puppeteers, you know, um, all trying to coordinate whatever they were doing at one time. You know, you had a whole team of, if you're inside of this thing, you had a whole team of people crawling around on the floor underneath you. You know, you wanted this, this little pulsing thing here. Well, that was a, one person doing that pulse, you know. <laughs> So it was very complicated. Yeah, that's amazing teamwork for oh, it is. one puppet. That's fantastic. It's, it's, it's in one scene. Yeah, so many yeah. That need it, to it's make it's that an amazing happen. it's Wonderful. an amazing thing when you get um, even if it's just you and one other performer when you find that person that you can connect with and and they are able to if they're assisting you they're able to follow you almost without you ever planning anything. You know, I work a lot with a guy named Mike Quinn who's one who's a great puppeteer. And he's also, he's done a lot of work on Star Wars. If you, if you guys see him at a Comic-Con, it'll be because of his work on Star Wars. But Mike is one of those people who could work alongside me, like running Kermit's right hand or something. And we almost never had to plan anything. You know, Mike just followed what I was doing, and we were in sync. Um, to the point where it didn't matter whether there was a script. I mean, it just, we just fell into place and worked together well, you know. That's always amazing when that happens. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks. Oh, sure, sure. Okay, what is your most favorite and least favorite Muppet song that you had to perform? <laughs> <laughs> um, most favorite, I'm trying to think like stuff on the Muppet Show because we did so much music. Um, I mean, more recently, I guess, I'm trying to think of the, some of the songs we did from the last movies because some of those were amazing. But one of my favorites that I ever did was on Muppets Tonight, we did a Talking Heads song. Uh, Letting the, what is it called? What's the one? Tell me the name of it, somebody. Once a Lifetime? Yeah, Once, once a, a lifetime. lifetime. Thank you. All I can think of is Water Flowing Underground. Oh, yeah. But that was a bizarre thing for Kermit to do, and I had a great time doing it. <laughs> um, and one of the least favorites are usually the ones that are the hardest to sing. We did, on The Muppet Show, we did the Hawaiian war chant. Uh, you know, I'll never forget it now. I'll, I know the lyrics for the rest of my life. I don't know what they mean. But I remember having to memorize that because you had to go in and sing it. Um, with a bunch of Muppet pigs or something. And I, uh, I was living on this place called Hampstead Heath, which is a big open green area north of London. We were shooting in England. And I would go out for a walk with my earbuds in and just listen to this over and over and over. So my impression of the Hawaiian war chant is that it's something you sing when you're walking through England. You know, it <laughs> makes no sense. It's, I, there's snow on the ground, but you're singing a Hawaiian song. You know? But that was probably the hardest thing we ever had to actually memorize. Because you couldn't read it. It was too many syllables. You know, you had to know it. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Sure, sure. <laughs>
Hi, Steve. Hey. So, out of all the characters you brought to life, who was the most difficult to create the mannerisms for to match the personality? Oh, that's interesting. Um, in in many ways, it was the uh, the ones that I had to concentrate the most on were some of the really larger characters, and I didn't have that many huge characters. But I, we did this thing called the Animal Show. I don't know whether anybody ever saw this thing, with because uh, it was pretty. It was on for a short time. We did it for Fox Children's Network called the Animal Show, and the two characters were Stinky and Jake. Stinky was a skunk, and Jake was this massive polar bear puppet that I did, and because he was so huge, and he towered above. Dave Gold's little lightweight puppet, the skunk, <laughs> and they were alongside each other. He was like, you know, two feet taller than the skunk. So the way his, you know, we're very much sticklers about where the characters are looking, their eye focus. So in order for Jake to look down at every other character on the set, I was working like that the whole time, <laughs> which hurts when you just do that. It, and then you're holding this enormous weight. And the other part is that that puts all the weight right on top of you. So it's pushing even more, right? And, and he was massive and heavy, and I wanted him to have trouble moving because he's so big he can hardly move. So I was playing him as though he had a lot of extra bulk. And so just remembering to do that and thinking about this big guy who had to turn like this, you know, he was very stiff-necked, and he went, oh, oh, when he moved, you know. And it was a challenge to do that, you know, just as a character. To remember to do that with his manner, it was much easier just to turn him, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. One other character we haven't brought up yet that you inherited was uh, Statler. Yeah. Uh, did you, I guess Muppets Tonight probably is where you got to do him the most, right? I think so. And Statler bounced back and forth between a few puppeteers for a while uh, until, until I kind of was the guy for a while. Um, yeah, Statler was also a character that was done by Richard Hunt, who did Beaker uh, on The Muppet Show. Prior to that, it was Jerry Nelson, one of our other performers, originally did Statler, and for whatever reason, Richard did him throughout the Muppet Show, so my memory of Statler was Richard's Statler. Right. It was a little bit different. Uh, so I was always trying to, to base what I did on what Richard had done, because I thought that more established Statler through the Muppet Show. Yeah. Um, and he was, I mean, he was great. Those, playing with those two guys got really raunchy off set. I mean, off camera. <laughs> because they're these two old, dirty old men, you know. So Dave and I would crack each other up the things that none of you will ever see. <laughs> you know, uh, they, they were fun. Awesome. Um, can you tell us your thoughts on the controversy of the Kermit Piggy breakup and Kermit's <laughs> love life during that time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Poor Kermit. Um, I, 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 what's worse, being with Miss Piggy or not being with Miss Piggy? I don't, you know what I mean? It's hard to. <laughs> Okay, so in all fairness, that's, that's, not, that's nothing misogynistic about that, ladies. Frank always said that Miss Piggy was a truck driver in a dress. <laughs> he, she was never meant to be a female role model. So, you know, and, and once in a while I have people come in and say, oh, I, as a little girl, Miss Piggy was a role model, and I'm thinking, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> that's terrible. Oh, my God. Um, but, you know, that was a funny thing. It, it, Jim and Frank, I think, had talked about doing that before Jim passed away, having a a, a time frame where they, just as a publicity thing, a marketing thing, to have Kermit and Piggy split up for a moment. Um, I don't think it was a great idea for it to span an entire series myself. I think it was a good thing. It, it was such a big deal when we did it in the press. It did exactly what Jim had talked about. It was a you know great thing, fun thing. But I but I think to I think in a way to base the whole series around it was the wrong way to go. They needed to kiss and make up or something. I mean. It, <laughs> You know, I, I understand why it was tried because it gave tension between the characters throughout the whole series, but I think they needed to be together. I, you know, it, it, it's you know, I th there, there was some thoughts that well, yeah, but they've been together for forty years. We need to change it up. I don't really think so. I think they needed to stay consistent. You know, in that way. Thank you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Hello there. Hi. Uh, I'm a longtime Fraggle Rock fan, oh, good. and I. I always noticed how Wembley was the only one who had eyes that moved. Yeah, yeah. My question is, what was the mechanism that controlled that? Yeah. And was that you? Um, it was a. It was built by, well, I don't know exactly who built it. it. There was a person who built many, many Muppet mechanisms, all the doozers, a guy named Foz Fazakas. Foz was this, um, he passed away some years ago, who built all the doozer vehicles and the little mechanical doozers. He's a, a genius. And he had a whole team of people. Um, a guy named um, 
Oh, God, it, you know what? I'm sorry. It all went right out of my head because I'm thinking about the rest of the story. <laughs> but, but he had a terrific team of people. Tom Newby was one of the guys, all these mechanical guys who built these little guys. Um, and the Wembley mechanism was mechanical. It, was, it ran on a battery. It was a little, two little motors that was on his eyes so that his eyes twirled. And I tried not to use it very much because I wanted it to really be a big deal when it happened. Uh, we, and it was a separate Wembley head. Because of the mechanism on the inside, it wasn't as comfortable to manipulate. He was a little bit stiffer. Mm -hmm. So I would save that eye mechanism until we really had a reason for his eyes to spin. He was going to pass out or he was going to look around the corner. Or, and so that's, I don't, I think if it, if it had happened in every episode, it probably wouldn't be that big a deal, you know. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, Wembley's eyes would rotate. And the funny part of them was that they were set so that they would do a full turn and I guess they would keep going, but as soon as you took your finger off the button, which was down here on the arm rod, they would retract back. They would always go back the other way. So whatever you were doing, you had to, you knew that that was going to happen. So you had to plan whatever actions you were doing to, you know, include the eyes going back the other way too, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, a, it was a great little gimmick in Wembley, you know. Thank you for solving the big, biggest mystery of my childhood. You got it. You got it. <laughs> Wembley, Wembley was probably, I, I said Rizzo was my favorite character, but Fraggle was probably my favorite show that I ever was a part of. It was so much fun, and it was such a great group of people working on that show, you know. Hi, um, this has been asked already, I apologize. Mm. Um, it took me a minute to find here. Um, what's your favorite Wilkins coffee commercial that Jim <laughs> did? Uh, it hasn't been asked, and um, well, there's a story that's my favorite story about it, but my, probably my favorite one is just the basic one where the guy gets shot with a cannon. Yeah. <laughs> those were such great, effective commercials, you know. Yeah. And those two characters are, you know, you can see in those two puppets where Jim was headed with everything he did. They were just these shapes with eyes, you know. And that's what the original Muppets largely were. You know, a lot of them were just that, that simple thing. But the story, the story as I heard it, so if this is wrong, somebody who knows more than me can correct it, is that they had done one commercial where... It was the basic thing, you know, one character would say, do you drink Wilkins coffee? The other would say, no, never heard of it. And then something would happen to the guy who said no. And the other one would turn and say, do you drink Wilkins coffee? Like he was going to do it to you. <laughs> great, great ad campaign. <laughs> so they did one where the guy had like a, a pistol, you know, a toy. It was probably shot powder out of it. And the guy said, do you drink Wilkins coffee? No, bang, so he shoots the guy. <laughs> and he says, do you drink Wilkins coffee? So cute, you know, cartoony violence. However... My understanding is that that was set to air on the night that John Kennedy was assassinated. Oh, wow. Oh, geez. So, and I don't think it ran. I think they maybe pulled it, but what unfortunate timing, right? So, <laughs> and it's interesting at that point in the American culture, I think, is when that type of violence started to maybe take on a little bit of a different meaning to people, you know? I mean, when I was watching Bugs Bunny cartoons, it was a whole different story, you know? And things have gotten much more tame in a way these days. I kind of miss the other, but I also understand, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, that's the Wilkins stuff, you know. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time. Sure, sure, sure. And actually, we have time for one more. So perfect. And I we see. have one more. Hey. Oh, I've saved the best for last, maybe. Okay, I good. So um, I, just, um, I just recently saw that new documentary about the guy who ended up becoming Elmo. Oh, uh, yeah, you guys, uh, Ryan. Yeah, I couldn't remember his name, yeah. But yeah. I just saw that, and um, I learned through that that uh, – Elmo originally nobody liked to play him, right? And I was kind of curious, like, was there any like one puppet that everyone at the shop just threw, hated to play, or was there one <laughs> like bugaboo puppet that no one liked? Wow, that's an interesting question. Uh, usually the heavy ones we yeah. avoided. <laughs> um, I can't think of anything, but yeah. but the Elmo story is different. I I think that's a situation where Richard Hunt was trying to do something with this thing. Yeah. And he didn't like the character because he didn't have a handle on on how to play the character. Mm -hmm. It was less about the puppet. And more about the character who the character itself. was going to be. Sometimes you just don't click with a puppet, you know. Yeah, it was, that was a beautiful documentary. I loved it. Yeah, I it haven't was, seen it. I didn't uh, realize it was out there. So there's a, yeah, so there's a documentary. It was about on, a, Ryan. I believe, Netflix or one of those. Okay. But it was it was wonderful. Yeah. Oh, good. I have to yeah. watch for that. Yeah. 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 I was. I was. I never knew that. Uh, apparently, when Elmo came out originally, before he took the character, yeah. he had like a much deeper, weird, like caveman voice, monster voice. <laughs> yeah, and it was yeah. very, very funny. Yeah, it was interesting. As I, re as I recall, Kevin's story, Kevin Clash's story, was that 
Richard basically walked off the set one day and just said, ah, I'm done with this puppet. You take it. He yeah. was like frustrated. Yeah. Yeah. And threw it at Kevin, and Kevin picked it up, and then there was Elmo, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Kevin had a different take on it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Elmo was always my favorite puppet, like a uh, yeah. Sesame Street yeah. puppet yeah. growing up, yeah. Well, you know, Kevin is, was an amazing, is an amazing puppeteer. Oh, uh, wonderful. The stuff, I know how hard it is. You guys may not even think about this, but we needed the the Elmo's World segments, which was like the last 15 minutes of Sesame Street. Oh, yes. Elmo spent an enormous amount of time looking directly at you as an audience in the camera. And that's hard to do when you've got a lot of dialogue it, because you either have to memorize every single word of 15 minute speech, which is hard, and concentrate on the puppetry. If you know your words, then okay, you're looking at the monitor and you know he's looking at camera. But if you're trying to talk and read, his eyes are gonna wander, he's gonna be all over the place, and Kevin, and Ryan's great too, same way, but but to keep that focus and to keep you keep an audience, especially little children, engaged while you're saying a bunch of words is hard. Yeah. It's a real talent. It's like Miss Mister Rogers, really, you know. Well, you've managed to keep us engaged. Oh, but I now hope so. The time has come I hope so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave, for being Thank here. Thank you guys. Appreciate Thank it. you very much.